Hi, I'm Dr. Patrick Garrett. Today's topic for our lay lecture is going to be thinking beyond gluten-free. And by far, this is probably one of our most popular talks, uh, at least the most requested thing. Because so many people are going gluten-free, uh, there's a lot of pitfalls people can fall in, and then also trying to figure out whether they should or shouldn't even go gluten-free or go wheat-free. Um, so this, this should help. And for many of you guys, you, you know me, but for those who don't, I have a practice in Newton, Kansas, where we help uh, patients reverse acute and chronic conditions naturally. I'm doing this over a decade and have patients all over the country and all over the world. And really, there's not much that you can't reverse because you caused it. And by doing or acknowledging that, that means you can actually uncause those things too, which makes my job a lot easier. National speaker, you know, I've taught physicians all across the country, uh, everything from internal disorders to functional medicine to clinical nutrition, uh, analyzing and interpreting uh, laboratory results. And then I have a lot of postdoctoral education, uh, really, you know, uh, Harvard's Lifestyle Medicine Program is a wonderful opportunity for physicians to do natural medicine. Uh, so you take the same medical cases, but you don't prescribe medications, you don't refer them out. And that is a awesome program. And then I've completed a lifestyle medicine program through Yale Medical School in uh, weight management. And there's five modules that we went through, and that's a really awesome uh, opportunity that I uh, was pleading a part of. Lots of diplomates and certifications, uh, everything from functional medicine to integrative nutrition, clinical nutrition, and even a senior fellow where we actually help uh, mentor uh, physicians into natural medicine. Lots of membership, uh, Harvard Medical School, Postgraduate Post Association, uh, American Board of Functional Medicine, Physicians Committee of Responsible Medicine. Uh, you know, these are all uh, organizations that I, I really uh, value and I, I find uh, that I like to really participate with those. And so you can see from all these, I mean, I eat, live, and breathe this stuff every day. Um, all right, so today, what are we going to cover? Well, what is gluten? What's the problem with gluten? and the difference between things like gluten sensitivities, wheat allergies, and real actual celiac disease. Should you get tested for, like we talked about in our other uh, lay lectures, and then avoiding the gluten-free pitfalls. And that's really important, because that's a place where people can really get trapped and they think they're doing a good thing, uh, but then have all these problems and, and get frustrated. So what is gluten? Well, you know, gluten, you know, it's glue. It's actually a Latin term for glue. It's in a lot of different grains and you know not just wheat and it's what allows dough to be elastic or doughy uh, you know it glues the molecules together so when that ferments and that air rises it traps the air inside of there and allows the, the bread to bake into a nice pretty loaf right and you look at this guy here that's uh, <laughs> swinging that dough over his head pretty sure that has a lot of gluten in there and I know that because that's phyllo dough. And phyllo dough is a very special blend of certain grains that allow the gluten to be uh, really potent in there uh, so they can stretch it over, I think, 28 square feet. And so they just take that dough ball, flatten that thing out and stretch it, stretch it all over the table, and then they do another one and another one and another one, and then they uh, chop that up and you got phyllo dough. So gluten is the glue. It's also something, you know, that... Uh, <laughs> pretty grossly is how you can have uh, you know postings on Facebook where it says uh, vegetarian duck well that's what it is it's just gluten and so uh, it was discovered by these Buddhist monks who were obviously vegetarian and they found that when they were working the the grains uh, in water that all the starches would, would go off and they were left with this kind of gummy gooey meat like substance uh, that worked really well for them and so you know from what they did back then to now you still see that used as a, a meat substitute and it's actually called uh, Satan uh, S-E-I-T-A-N uh, so never have Satan over for dinner is my rule of thumb here now with any of these grains there's three main parts you know, there's the outer bran there's the endosperm and then there's the germ and Grains can be super healthy, but what we do to them as Americans is we really synthesize those, uh, you know, extrapolate only the, the starch part, and that's how we take wheat bread or whole grain bread and make Wonder Bread, right? So the bran is 80% mineral fiber, and you know, like our other late lectures about 
irritable bowel and Crohn's and ulcerative colitis and constipation and diarrhea. Brand's a big part of how to fix that because it's very, very cheap. Just, you know, it, it's a cheap fix for gut problems like uh, beans are for cholesterol. Well, the bulk of that is bran. And, you know, they, as you make Wonder Bread, well, then they sell the bran as something else. But you should eat it whole. The germ is that center part, and that's the uh, part that has the uh, vitamins in there, especially the fat soluble vitamins, and the omega 3s. So, again, there's vitamin E in there, there's omega 3s in there. Very, very healthy things, or potentially, right? And then the endosperm is, is really where we're going to concentrate when we talk about glutens. That's where the carbohydrates and the proteins are stored, and that's the energy for the uh, seedling to, to grow from or sprout from. So that uh, gluten, or uh, the protein there, actually breaks down into two different things. And so you can see the little strings over there, and then you can see the, the pearls. Um, and the gluten is going to break down into gliadin, and then uh, glutenin, and then also gluteomorphine. And so that's right, uh, there's actually morphine in bread. And that's why when you think about bread, you think of comfort foods. So one of the things that we do with our patients when we talk about bread and dairy is do you like it or do you love it? And you know what? People love their bread. They love their dairy. And that's because they are addicted. They are crack addicts on bread, right? And the morphine, studies show that the morphine in those are 20 times more potent than the, than the drug, right? So they truly are uh, comfort food addicts. And the American diet, to no surprise, is 75% uh, drugs. So, you know, all this comfort food, like your, you know, your dairy, your cheese, your, your uh, um, ice cream, of course, right? And, and your breads, you know, they, they bring back these kind of memories for you. And they really do possess this drug-like effect. So, uh, not only do we have to deal with the idea of just, oh, get rid of wheat, right? Or get rid of gluten. But we also have to deal with the fact that we're, uh, we have to cure the drug side of that too, right? And that's where things like dopamacuna or fava beans and those things come in uh, really handy. So the woes of wheat, you know, this shouldn't be any surprise for most people. You know, a lot of gut problems with that, IBS and, uh, uh, and again, not just wheat, but gluten, right? But your Crohn's, your ulcerative colitis, reflux, all those things. And really, gut problems, I love a patient with gut problems. I mean, my gosh, that's, that's a week to fix those people for the most time. You know, there was a, a patient we had that had, you know, ulcerative colitis that was just uh, bleeding like a stuffed pig and going 20 times a day. Yeah, it took a little bit longer to fix him, but we did more for him in, you know, three months to get that thing knocked out than, uh, than he's been doing on medication for years. And so many of these people will be treated for years, chronic, you know, drug management for years. And eventually the, the end result is they usually just chop the bowel out and you poop in a bag and say, la vie, you got to take vitamins for the rest of your life. And that's not really the way that you want to go. In fact, my um, course this year that I took uh, for Crohn's is very different from the Crohn's one that, uh, several years ago through Harvard. And the, the original one, the IBS, and I took the Crohn's one too, they were both like, oh, it's the food, stop eating these things and re-inoculate the gut bacteria. And the I, you know, the IBS and the Crohn's goes away, right? That's the cure. It's stop doing it and help the body heal. This time, when I took the IBS and Crohn's, it was the new, updated information from the medical aspect, and it was: patient takes this med, there's complications. Switch them to this meds. Complications. Switch them to this med. Complication. Patient doesn't want any more meds, so switch them to this. Patient still has complications. Resect the bowel, poop in a bag, and you're done. I mean, that's insane. You could have two approaches to the same condition where one person just fixes it very quickly and the next one's pooping in a bag. So what we want to do is prevent the unnecessary surgeries, the unnecessary uh, medications, right? So gut problems are awesome because gut is something we're causing and they turn over 70 trillion a day. So if there's a problem with those cells, we can change that. And it really only takes a very minimal amount. Harvard, we learned that it takes a, a breadcrumb worth of wheat to have enough gluten in there to actually change the cell structure. That's one fiftieth of a slice of bread to change the cell lining of your gut. And the absorption goes from a football field worth of tissue to the end zone. 
and very quickly you end up with vitamin deficiencies and then you have all kinds of problems so the brain issues uh, pretty common stuff you know your brain fog depression anxiety dizziness you know for me when I eat uh, gluten I mean I just get like tired really quickly I can be like amped up ready to go I eat a little, a little bread or something and boy I'm just like you know wheels grind to a halt but for other people and a lot of people anxiety is a big problem with that uh, we even have a one patient that had schizophrenia because the wheat messes up the gal uh, sorry the uh, bowel which then messes up the absorption which then prevents the B1 which then ends up causing Wernicke's encephalopathy with the uh, Kortzhoff syndrome in the brain because there's no uh, B1 uh, to actually uh, process the glucose and then it builds up holds water and the brain swells from this right that's insane so the other thing is skin skin is probably one of the most common things we see uh, next to gut stuff so the, your eczema your psoriasis again when you think chronic think what am I chronically eating any chronic condition what am I chronically doing and you know the chicken skin the keratosis polaris uh, you know that's on the upper arm here on people you know, it's, it's those little dry hair follicles that, that are pinched out like chicken skin uh, that's an omega deficiency right but it's because of the uh, poor absorption in the gut for those omega 3's and of course rheumatoid rheumatoid big time big time gluten um, General issues, you know, your chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, hormone stuff, even infertility in PCOS. You know, polycystic ovarian uh, syndrome is, is very common with this. Uh, boy, gluten will mess you up if you have sensitivities to it. And if you don't, wheat will just <laughs> cause a lot of problems on its own because of the uh, modification of wheat and hybridization of wheat. So with food sensitivities, always think chronic problems it's chronic if it's chronic 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 it's something I'm chronically doing and that's what makes my job easy right if somebody has this stuff all the time great what are you doing all the time let's make changes and see what improves so the difference between these two and we talked about this there's a better chart and I think the the next lecture that we did um, but you know your allergies are not sensitivities or intolerances allergies are very obvious things they're very rare things and they're IgE things those are the things that 99% of physicians are going to say, oh, I know what that is. You know, if you have an allergy, they know that's an IgE allergy. That's all they can understand, right? Now, the more common or the most common is the IgG intolerances, right? It's the uh, immune reactions that are due to intolerance or sensitivities to foods, and they are delayed. And they can be delayed up to three to four days, which means when you eat this food, the symptom might not be for three days. So I don't get the asthma, I don't get the allergies, I don't get the eczema for three days. And that makes it very difficult to figure out. And that's why testing is probably the, the best way to do that next to a food law. And the wonderful thing about it is it's reversible. It's just an autoimmune thing. you got to got a molecular mimicry that you got to fix. So wheat allergies. Now that is uh, from eating or even contact. You know, uh, Sherry, who's our nurse, uh, she used to make bread all the time and her hands would just be red and they'd get little blisters in between here. Uh, you know, so easy, easy to figure out. Within wheat, there's actually 27 potential allergens that have been identified. Uh, and this, these are the, just the newest ones that we've added to that. And so, I mean, my gosh, we've really modified that plant so much from the days of pine, corn, and emmer. Type 1 is going to be immediate and hypersensitive, right? It's going to be a very inflammatory process. And the reason you don't need a test for that for most people is not only because it's very rare and, and the least amount of people, but it's going to be something that when I eat peanuts, I swell up every time, right? With delayed, I eat peanuts today, sometimes I'm inflamed, other times not. Because it's not always going to be just the peanuts. It might be peanuts plus this equal enough sensitivity to cause a reaction. So the way this works, as you can see up there, you have the allergen that which looks like a little star, and it's going to um, bind to, um, well actually the, the, the T cell is going to tell it, uh, which is the one on the right, the blue one, and it's going to find that allergen, and then it's going to go tell the B cell. And when it, it presents an antigen to the B cell, then the B cell, which makes antibodies, 
is going to divide up into two cells. You're going to have the plasma cell, which is going to pump out about 3,000 antibodies per second, and you're going to have a memory cell, which is basically just a wanted poster. If we see this allergen again, we're not going to have a delay. We're going to have an immediate response. And that's why when you get stung by the bee the first time, nothing. You get stung by it the second time, your throat swells up. So the plasma cell starts dumping out those uh, little Ys, uh, and those are antibodies. And these antibodies are going to be IgE antibodies. And so when they hit that receptor for a sensitized mast cell, that mast cell is going to start dumping um, histamines. And those histamines then cause inflammatory reactions all over the body. So smooth muscle like the heart and the blood vessels, uh, mucus glands, platelet ac activation, so more clots and strokes, heart attacks, uh, and then of course it's going to sensitize the nerves and then cause a whole cascade of inflammatory reactions to happen. And that's why if you have a true sensitivity, uh, you know, it, it affects all of these things. So it doesn't matter necessarily if it's uh, IgG or an IgE, this, this chain reaction is the same, it's just delayed or immediate. Now, gluten sensitivities or intolerances, these are uh, probably the most common things you're going to see. Now, we like to call them non-celiac wheat sensitivities, or NCWS. Uh, often, the old school term, they'll call them an IgG reaction. Well, that's not old school, but they, they would call them non-IgE reaction. Um, and these are poorly tolerated substances that cause reactions or cause immune responses or molecular mimicry. Uh, we said they're delayed and they're often dose dependent, so a little tiny fraction may not always cause problems, uh, but if you keep doing that all the time, it will cause problems. So it tends to be the things that you eat a lot, and often it's the things that you crave, which makes it even more messed up because you are craving the things that make you bad, or worse, or feel horrible, right? No matter what, the result is inflammation, and the inflammation then results in the symptoms. So what about celiac? Now, celiac is a little bit different here because celiac is an immune reaction to gliadin, specifically gliadin. Uh, it's caused by leaky gut, which then allows gliadin peptide to trigger uh, uh, immune response, and it does it through the innate and the adaptive. And so this is a pretty uh, prolific uh, disease for people to have. I mean, this is something you don't want to play with at all, uh, which makes the pitfalls even more uh, prone for these people. And of course there's the autoimmune version and that's the, the antibodies for the anti-trans uh, glutaminase and of course that's the stuff that they glue meat together with so you'll see in your, um, you know, your deli meat where you have a turkey that looks like this at the deli, uh, um, a chicken looks like that, ham looks like that, that, that doesn't exist in nature right? But when you cut through that meat it's a solid piece of meat and that's because they take all the scraps, put some tissue transaminase on there and glue it together. So that becomes a very big problem for celiac people. And that's actually going to change the structure, which is the villus atrophy. That's actually going to atrophy is a trophy is growth and A is without. So it's actually going to lead to flattening of the villi, which then leads to a malabsorption syndrome. So again, you're, you're just decreasing all the nutrients that you can eat. So even if you eat healthy, you're not going to get the vitamins, minerals, trace elements, phytonutrients, phytosterols anymore because the absorption has decreased so much. And for celiac, and, and really I think we can put wheat in here too, uh, you know, it's a complex uh, evolution that's occurred between the grain and uh, the human and uh, uh, the agricultural development of what we do. So all those changes then create this perfect storm where it causes lots of problems. Um, this is a nice little chart that kind of sums up what we talked about, you know, the allergy or sensitivity. We'd say allergy is going to be the acute side of the, the IgE, which causes inflammation. Well, if we have a delayed sensitivity, all right, it goes through either T cells or innate immune system or IgG, IgA, IgM, even IgD, right? Um, and it doesn't matter. The end result is you get inflammation. The mast cells are going to release histamines and you're going to have a histamine uh, histidelia response. So that leads to tissue damage long term, which then we call a disease. We're going to keep eating those same foods. We're going to get the same inflammatory response. So we're going to call it a disease. So let's talk about testing. Testing uh, you know, can be really good or it can be really bad. 
Typically, the tests that people do for the acute or the IgE uh, reactions, they often will do these, you can see over here to the right, where it's a pinprick test. And those, those have a high false positive because they're such a highly inflammatory person that they're going to be allergic to far more things than they really are. They're going to react to far more things. Those patients, you could take the, the back of a big pin and go across their skin and it'll welt up. It doesn't mean they're allergic to big pins. It means they're highly inflammatory, right? And so these are not specific. You have to do a blood test. Now the IgE blood test, really good, right? But it's kind of useless because every time I eat that food, I have the symptom. So that's kind of worthless. Um, the sensitivities, the best thing you want to do is really IgG testing. There's other testing you can do that's probably two, three times more expensive, but it doesn't change the outcome. Whether you test the, um, the leukocytes or you test the general IgG, you know, over 13 years, it's been cheaper for my patients just to do the IgG, get rid of those, the symptoms go away, hallelujah, everybody's happy. I've always had that other test on the back end of like, okay, well, if we don't fix this person, now we have another test, but we haven't needed it yet. And so, you know, that's great. And a lot of functional medicine doctors are really, really amped on doing these really expensive tests, but I don't think you have to. And that's what we taught our physicians out in Colorado is that, you know, if you didn't have a bunch of labs and supplements, could you reverse disease? And you better say you can, right? Because the body is designed to heal given the right opportunity. So you want a blood test. You can do um, um, uh, food logs, you know, and, and really test that out. You know, really, you know, kind of, here's everything that I've eaten, and here's all my symptoms, and then you try to tie these relations from the food over to the symptoms. Sometimes it's very easy, and sometimes it's very, very difficult. But really, blood testing is so cheap now. Uh, you, uh, cheap, like $300 cheap, but it's better than $1,200, which is what a lot of places charge. So it's wonderful. You get 184 different foods. So not only the foods that you're allergic to that are kind of obvious things we tell people, but all the foods that we want them to eat, all the quinoa and the millet and the, the gluten-free grains, are those sensitivities too. Well, now they finally are testing those. And of course, celiac testing is a very easy test. It's, it's moderately expensive, probably a couple hundred bucks, um, but it's very accurate. So and there's several ones you can do, and they all have about the same accuracy level. Um, if you look at, you know, what these, like a general IgG test, you know, this is what it would look like. And you can see if it's red, it's something that's inflamed. And then if it's on a 1, 2, or 3, that's just measuring the amount of inflammation uh, based on the Petri dish where they're, where they're culturing this. So this person here, obviously, you know, there's allergic to wheat and the, the, the baker's yeast to make the bread. If they had bran in there, that's the worst. If they had gluten in there. Um, if they did nuts and seeds, this person would be having a whole kind of uh, problem here. So, and they did. <laughs> this is one of my patients. Uh, so, you know, if you test positive then for wheat, well, what do you do, right? And so we've gotten all kinds of crazy gluten-free, you know, products. But are they healthy? Is that what you want to do? And one of the things that we uh, deal with with our patients is constantly diet and food and cooking and food preparation. And, uh, you know, my goal is to really cut through the crap with patients because there's so many people selling ideas, uh, you know, and there's always these books that really complicate everything. But we want to find the simplicity in things. We want to teach the simplicity of things. So let's let's talk about uh, avoiding pitfalls here, right? Gluten is not just wheat, so that's huge. We have a, a, a I think it was our nurse went to a, a restaurant and you know said, well, I'd like to order this. You know, is there any uh, gluten in there? And he said, no, 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 it's just white bread. And it's like, no, 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 white bread is wheat bread, <laughs> right? And which has gluten. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Is there something else? Oh, yeah, you know, we, we could do uh, uh, barley if that's okay or, you know. And, and the, the, the things that he was offering were also full of gluten. And so most people out there, most restaurants aren't going to be, you know, your savior. You want a little chart that says, hey, this is what the grains are, just like this one here, and keep that with you. And so you know that things like buckwheat, which say wheat, is actually okay. It's not. It's not a uh, wheat, uh, you know. And where emmer corn or einkorn, 
is actually not corn, it's wheat. And so einkorn would be, you know, problematic for you, but buckwheat wouldn't. And that's probably the only two major confusions that you'll have. Uh, but this will help you get rid of uh, uh, mo most of the, the spectrum here. There's a lot more other than that. The, the next thing is something that we really emphasize, and that's be gluten-free, don't eat gluten-free, right? Just eat foods that are naturally gluten-free, like your quinoa, your rice, your, your oats, um, your buckwheat, those kind of things that you don't have to have highly processed gluten-free stickers on them, right? So, just like this, you have gluten-free Dunkin' Donuts. Is that healthy? Well, no, it's not healthy at all. And often what happens is, you know, we went from heavy bread like einkorn and emmer bread from from the days of jesus you know and then we said well we want to make you know fluffy things out of these uh and so then we started modifying and changing those into today's wheat where we can make donuts right and then uh, wonder bread and then we said well no no wonder bread doesn't have any nutrition in there you need to go back to the whole grains because now we have lots of colon cancer well then we go back to the whole grains and then people say oh well don't eat wheat it's full of gluten we have too many problems with uh uh, wheat sensitivities and so then they just go to non wheat or non gluten breads that are just wonder bread again and they're not healthy and in fact you know you might get rid of your anxiety by giving up gluten but then get it back because you're eating high glycemic and so the things that you want to avo uh, sorry, avoid are the corn starch, the rice flour, tapioca starch, potato starch you want to eat real, actual food, not processed foods. And one of the things, you know, like we get people away from dairy and wheat and meat, you know, uh, you don't have to be vegetarian, but, you know, just don't eat so much dang meat, right? And uh, so what do they do? They want to eat fake stuff. Well, can they eat fake cheese and fake meat and fake bread, right? But, you know, it, it ends up being problematic for most people. And so it's easier just to kind of step away and say, what else can I eat that I don't have to sit there and wonder am I going to kind of screw up as I'm getting better. The third one is really looking at the hidden gluten. Soy sauce is a big, big place for this and that's why you want to do Bragg's amino acids. Right? You want organic soy and that's it. That's in there. Um, pickles, if they have malt vinegar, that's going to be uh, problematic because malt usually is maltodextrin. It's going to be made from uh, corn but also it can be made from wheat. And you want to replace those with things like bubbies, right? Bubby pickles are awesome because they're fermented and you got trillions of bacteria in there. And so, you know, that $4 bottle of pickles or sauerkraut ends up being about $400 worth of supplements for re-inoculation of your gut bacteria to help get rid of the dysbiosis or the small bowel bacterial overgrowth and leaky gut. Got to be aware of meat. Meat that doesn't look like real meat, that's glued, right? And so... Uh, there's a wonderful thing on there on uh, um, yeah you can find it on YouTube but it was a, a, a news organization did it where they looked at and showed how they glue the meat together and it's pretty bad it's pretty bad uh, but it really made me think when I went at the deli in the rest or in the in the grocery store I started thinking there is no meat on the turkey that looks like this right there's no ham that looks like that no bone right it's just every animal is that shape and so uh, I thought, okay. I used to work at a deli. I didn't notice any bones or anything in there. So it's just glued together. So you want gluten-free meat too. Uh, because not only are they gluing it, but there's also injecting gluten into turkey breasts to make them more tender. So, you know, you could be going gluten, ditch the bread, eat a bunch of turkey meat, and next thing you know, you still have the gluten problems. Don't eat fake meat. Just don't eat meat. Either eat meat or don't eat meat, right? But Eat your grass-fed, grass-finished, non-corn-fed, you know, feedlot animals. And otherwise, the fake meat is just Satan. And just like, you know, I say the dairy is the devil, fake meat is Satan, right? Literally, it is Satan. So don't eat it. Uh, so real meat or no meat. Dressings, the modified food starches, there's, you know, and plus other things, those are often going to be uh, sources of gluten. And so oil and vinegar... Or just make your own dressings. They're very simple. You can find lots of different recipes uh, online. And just modify things just a little bit to make them healthier. Chips often are going to have the, the flavoring in there. Natural flavoring is going to be gluten. And then any of those ingredients like dextrin, which just means sugar. Maltodextrin, which means sugar plus sugar plus sugar. Modified starch, which starch is just 
going to be sugar, uh, natural flavors, and artificial flavors. Uh, you're going to be thinking gluten when you see those things. Often they're made from, and you'll see this, that they're made from corn. They, a lot of them are. But if you have things like celiac, if you have gluten problems, you know, if it really causes problems in your life, these aren't worth it. They're not. You know, and they're usually added to food because the food uh, is processed crap. So, you know, don't eat processed crap. <laughs> you don't have a problem. All right, so solutions. Well, if you suspect you have a sensitivity, do a provocative test. Stay away from foods. And really, wheat and dairy is going to be your main ones to stay away from. And see, does it get better? The other thing is do a food sensitivity test and just get a blood test and see. It's, it's easy. Then you know what not only you can't eat anymore, but you'll know what you can eat. And that's wonderful information. Ditch the bread or use a paleo bread recipe. I'm not exactly the biggest fan of any uh, you know, uh, uh, diet book, especially uh, you know, paleo. I, I like a little bit of it, but just like every book, I like a little bit and then that, not much else. But paleo part of that uh, for bread, I like. so. Uh, if you look up on Google and you say uh, paleo bread recipe or paleo muffin recipe, they don't like corn and wheat in these grains, and so you're going to get nut and seed flours, which is going to be wonderfully healthy for you. Make sure you eat foods that are naturally gluten-free, so you don't have to worry about it, right? Whole grains, like brown rice, and don't just eat brown rice, right? Stay away from white rice. But don't just eat brown rice. Go to the Chinese stores and get red rice and black rice and even forbidden rice, which is like purple. Uh, quinoa is wonderful. There's 1,800 different variations of quinoa, but we eat like uh, three, right, if you're lucky. You want the, the white, the black, and the red. And really, you want to mix together or the black and the red because, again, more flavonoids and phytonutrients. Now, oats are gluten-free. But if you have a sensitivity, you want to make sure that you get gluten-free oats that are certified gluten-free. So a lot of times there's cross-contamination there. Eat the least processed foods in the most natural forms, obviously, and replace breads with just fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, berries, and, and greens and legumes, right? And, and lots of them. They're all full of protein, healthy fat, and healthy carbohydrates because carbohydrates are very, very healthy if you eat healthy ones. Uh, you know, don't eat gluten-free crap. All right, so that sums it up, right? Your disease is your diet. Your cure is your food. That's what we should do is prescribe nutrition in this country. And really, it is the cheapest, most effective uh, uh, medicine you'll ever have. Well, I thank you for attending, and I hope you really enjoyed this. And uh, feel free to look up more of our lay lectures. And uh, talk to you soon. Oh, shit. All right.